So good afternoon, good morning, and uh, welcome to our open house with the Department of Humanities and Politics at Nova Southeastern University's Hamels College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, my name is Teddy Uy. I'm one of the assistant directors here with the uh, Hamels College graduate admissions team. Uh, joining from our office, we have one of our admissions counselor, Farah Amro, as well as from the Department of Humanities and Politics, Dr. Ransford Edwards. Uh, hopefully shortly later on too, you may also get to meet our department chair, uh, Dr. Nelson Bass uh, III, I believe. <laughs> Uh, but we'll get right into it then. So I wanted to get uh, everyone a little bit familiar with our university. So to start us off, we have uh, quite a few different graduate offerings. Now, what we're going to be focusing on here tonight is, of course, our Master's of Science program in National Security Affairs and International Relations. Uh, you do also have opportunities to do an optional concentration within cybersecurity, uh, which you'll get to hear about in just a little while here. Now, to look at our campus a little bit closer, we are located actually on several different satellite campuses around the state of Florida, but the main campus is located in the Fort Lauderdale Davy area. Uh, what you're actually seeing here on screen is uh, one of our uh, larger buildings on the campus, which is our Don Taft University Center. Uh, includes a, a variety of amenities for a lot of our students. Now, for our graduate level students, in reference to the MS and National Security Affairs program, you do have the opportunity to take this program both in person and online. So if you'd like to come and look at our university, feel free to email myself or uh, Fair if you'd like to learn more and maybe set up a tour. Now, more specific locations that you'd be uh, getting familiar with if you chose to do this program in person would be both the Millman Hollywood building, which you're seeing on the left hand side there. Uh, we have a beautiful little alt yeah, excuse me, red art sculpture that you'd see right out front. And that's where it houses uh, many of the Hamos College uh, academic department offices, including our Department of Humanities and Politics and several others. Uh, whereas on the right hand side, we have the Carl DeSantis building, which is one of our major classroom spaces on the campus. You'd be having a variety of your lectures uh, all in the different various floors. And there's also a variety of study areas and even some food options on campus so that we can keep you fed while you do your studies. Now I wanted to go ahead and introduce our department chair, uh, Dr. Nelson Bass. Now, he may be joining in a little bit later on, but he did just want to uh, have his welcomes for all of our students attending over here. But uh, we'll get to jump back to him hopefully later on. So we'll keep moving along. And Dr. Edwards, take it away. Ooh. Thanks, Teddy. Really appreciate it. So my name is Ransford Edwards, assistant professor in the Department of Humanities and Politics and also the graduate coordinator for our program. So welcome, um, Elizabeth, and I'm um, Ryan, uh, obviously. Would love to see you in the in the future, right? Um, so we are right national security and international relations. So the program has done a little bit of transition recently to factor more, um, in the realm of international relations. Um, it's a master's degree. We previously had a certificate program, but it's a master's degree, um, with thirty six credits, um, with a variety of core. And elective courses, and we'll see. We have um, Al just jumped on. All right, so you can go to the next slide. All right, so we have, again, a variety of faculty um, that has a variety of backgrounds. We have one um, professor that has spent over 20 years on a nuclear submarine. Um, and we have, um, you know, well-published historians, um, which teach, you know, from philosophy, um, border security, literature and film, um, disaster politics, um, and international political economy, right? So this is a variety of um, faculty with a variety of speci um, specialities. Right, that would obviously meet your needs and beyond. What's the next slide? And you can go to the next one. All right, per perfect. All right, so the program, 24 months, Um, right? Some students finish it faster, right? So a lot of our students end up in the public sector, but also in the private sector. We have a slew of students uh, currently in DC, again, working for um, a variety of actors. We also have students that are currently um, in academia, also getting their um, PhD, right, in political science and, and you know, additional um, majors. Um, so our program really is about balancing, right, conceptual and practical work focus. Um, so again, we have a variety of professors that have spent years in our national intelligence and national security apparatus, and also a variety of faculty that have done um, uh, major research, right, on things like political economy, history, and political science. There is also an optional cybersecurity concentration that will kind of get your feet wet, right, 
um, in the discipline of um, cybersecurity. Um, and again, all our classes are taught, well, majority are done online, but we do have a variety of courses that are taught in a hybrid mode, right? So that would be students can either show up on ground or via Zoom at a set time, which I actually enjoy, right? So if you are a student that is overseas and you don't maybe have the ability to be on campus, we have something for you. But if you like, right, the traditional graduate setting, right, being in a room and, and right, having these um conversations, we also have that for you. That's actually my preferred mode of instruction. And much of that is done um, in the, as, as Teddy pointed out previously, in our Mailman Hollywood building, right, on our Davy campus. Um, and again, our curriculum um, spans wide, terrorism, international law, and national security affairs. So you can go to the next slide, Teddy. All right, so here are some of our core courses, and that includes things like border security, national intelligence collection, research and ev evaluation, right? So there's a research methods class. I actually suggest you take, if possible, you take that course um, um, pretty early because that can kind of set the tone for what you want to do later. There's ethical issues in national security. And one of my favorite courses is international relations, theory and practice. Um, again, that's a huge thing now. So we have a session coming up in the fall. So, you know, if you are, um, sorry, not in the fall, in the winter, winter 2025. So if you are interested in that course, I'd love to see you in that course. It's traditionally run Wednesday nights from six to nine, but I think I may change it to Tuesday nights. So we'll see how that goes. So those are our 21 credits um, in our core curriculum. And now we also have a variety of um, elective courses, right? Which again, give you a wider breadth of things that we do. So there's civil liberties and national security, things like international law, which is running right now, cyber conflict and statecraft, economic statecraft, which I also enjoy. And we have a variety of special topics um, in previous years. One of the pictures you saw earlier was our trip to Cuba. So we took a, um, students to Cuba and that course was a special topics looking at the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we got to tour Cuba, right? And see some of those actual sites, right? That are, um, you know, that are actually still, um, still highly um, maintained, right? And veneered in, in Cuba. And again, we have, um, uh, so one thing about grad school, um, Al, Elizabeth, and Ryan, it's easy to get in, but sometimes it's difficult to get out. So there's two ways to get out of program, and that is through our thesis and our um, tabletop exam. Um, so you can go to the next slide, um, Teddy. Um, so this here's the cybersecurity um, concentration. Again, nine credits. This is not taught in our department, right? Right, you're in uh, another department, but again, like these courses can actually get your feet wet in things like um, information systems and information security. All right, so you can go to the next slide. All right, so let me let me just I guess it's go back to you, Teddy, but let me just I finish the point in regarding um, how you get out of the program. So after you have about thirty credits out of your thirty six, we will say, okay, look, you have to make a decision. Uh, you can take a table talk tabletop exam, a comprehensive exam that runs two weekends. And essentially you will have 24 hours to kind of answer um, a variety of questions, right? So it's it's a multi-question format um, and you do that over two weekends, 24 hours, and then that gets evaluated um, by our readers and you're right, we let you know if you pass or fail. Um, the other way to leave our program is through the thesis method, which I really enjoy and I actually recommend it because when you are done, you will have created, right, new knowledge, right? And you will immediately be published um, through NSU libraries, right? So if you want to become a published scholar and to be, right, ability to be cited in a peer-reviewed um, setting, I would definitely suggest the thesis option. This goes for two back-to-back -back semesters. It is a lot of work, but I think we will have prepared you enough in courses like research and evaluation and some of our core courses for you to excel um, at this aspect. Um, so yeah, that's how you um, enter the program. This is some of the things we have in the program and that is how you leave the program. So I'll pass it on to Teddy to kind of explain more um, you know, about the program, about the university. Thanks, Dr. Edwards. 
So uh, as you got to hear a little bit earlier, uh, you met some of our larger team over here. Uh, some of them couldn't be with us today, but uh, myself will be your main contact for the application process for the MS and National Security Affairs program. Uh, if you have any more general questions about the program, I'm usually happy to assist. Uh, and if I don't have the answer, of course, I can always get you in contact with Dr. Edwards or even Dr. Bass if necessary. But everyone else here you're going to see on the slide can assist you if you need to reach out for with any general questions, say if you know you can't get a hold of me for any reason. So uh, as a quick introduction, starting on the far left there, we have our director for the Hal Most Graduate Admissions team, uh, Brett McAllister. He does express his condolences for not being able to attend today. Uh, we have uh, Miss Megan Troy, who's one of our fellow assistant directors. Uh, presently, she's on uh, personal leave right now. But if you ever call into our general lines uh, that you're seeing stipulated on this slide here, you'll actually get Andrew there on the far right. So uh, he'll usually be able to connect you with me or depending if it's a more general question about the university, he may be able to answer himself as well. Sorry. Now, to talk about deadlines for a second here, we conduct rolling applications with our uh, program here for the MSN National Security Affairs and International Relations Program. Uh, looking into the uh, upcoming term for the winter 2025 semester, that is going to be just around the corner here. Actually, to the date, in fact, you have one month. So November 15th, that is going to fall on a Friday for us. And we do typically find ourselves trying to stay around that Friday deadline, just so you have, of course, that preceding week to get in any remaining materials. Now, looking further into the future, we do also offer acceptance for summer and fall. So the next term would be our summer 2025 term, and you'd be looking at April 18th. And again, that'll be a Friday for you. Or I know for a lot of students that may be looking a little bit further into the future, say after if you're still completing your bachelor's degree, uh, degree at present, you may be looking for the fall 25 semester, and that one will be July 18th. Now, in terms for anyone on that note that has not completed their bachelor's degree, just keep in mind you must be in your final semester of your degree program in order to be formally reviewed. And that's so that we have a more accurate representation of your cumulative GPA and can also see a little bit more on what type of courses that you've been taking during your time in your bachelor's. So on the actual subject of the application requirements over here, we're going to have a general NSU application, and we'll be actually taking a look at what this is really going to look like if you would be looking to formally apply. So that's going to involve areas like your biographic, demographic information, prior college information, and a little uh, few other legal uh, excuse me, disclosures. On top of that, there is a $50 fee associated with applying, but for all of our attendees here at the open house, we are happy to give out a waiver code, which we'll send later on uh, after this has concluded here today. Now, you will be submitting transcripts from all previously attended higher education institutions. So usually we don't need high school transcripts. If you're unsure, say if you came in with like dual credits or college credits, feel free to talk with us and we can look at that in a little bit more detail. Generally speaking, uh, you should submit transcripts from all previously attended higher education institutions where college credit was received. Now, it may add our, uh, we may look at it a little bit closer. So if it's not a direct correlative to the program, it may not be completely necessary. So if say like you took like a random Spanish class at a community college, might not necessarily need that, but we will be happy to take a look. Uh, nonetheless, you'll have two letters of recommendation, ideally should come from an academic source, such as a past professor, advisor, uh, maybe a program director, anything like that. Uh, and we do accept professional letters of recommendation. My comment with that is just generally to make sure that your intended reference understands the purpose of the letter. In some instances, we have had professional letters that uh, don't do a whole lot in terms of describing the student. Um, what we're looking at is trying to learn more about the student as it can be applicable to the academic setting. So, you know, anything like traits, characteristics, stories, uh, things of that nature that we can start to see and how that can be relatable, say, to the academic setting is uh, a little bit preferred, and that gives you a little stronger of a letter of recommendation. Um, in terms of your essay, it's going to be between 500 and a thousand words. You'll have the prompt for that uh, once you get over to the general application portion. And then we do require a writing sample. Now, I know it says academic writing sample, but they do also accept professional uh, writing samples. Uh, what they just generally, uh, I should say, the uh, program office generally says is that they want this to be as best of an accurate representation of your writing skills. So as long as that is what you believe, feel free to submit that over. Uh, of course, if, say, you had done a larger writing project in the past, maybe like a senior thesis or something, uh, we maybe want to look at getting a core sample of that because I don't know if they're going to be able to read through an entire thesis. Um, 
of course, Dr. Edwards uh, is always ample, as you've heard about doing your thesis work. So I'm sure he appreciates it a lot more. Um, and then we're ideally looking for a candidate of a 3.0 or higher for their cumulative GPA. If you're falling below that GPA threshold, feel free to come and, uh, excuse me, connect with me. We can take a look at things a little bit closer. We've had students uh, accepted into the program in the past that have fallen below that GPA requirement, but we found other aspects of their application to be stronger and more reflective of the student's capabilities. Um, so by no means, uh, don't feel daunted if, say, the 3.0 GPA seems a little bit harder for you. We can definitely look into it and talk uh, more about it. Now, looking into the actual uh, view of the application, this first picture you're seeing on the screen is going to be your account overview. Once you've actually created an account with us here, this is where you're going to be able to see some of that general information that you had uh, just put in. So some of just like your general biographic information, as well as an interested program where you would then subsequently be able to start the formal application. If you have any issues at all, I usually recommend contacting, excuse me, contacting our office first, uh, just so that we can kind of field what the issue is before we direct you to the best areas. Um, only reason I say that is in many instances, if you do reach out to Shark IT Services, they sometimes can bounce you around depending if you describe the issue in an incomplete fashion. So that's why if you at least talk with us first, then we can get a better understanding of where your issue really is and then explain that in proper format for our IT services if it's needed for them to step in at that time. Now, uh, the first portion of the application is going to be your bio, excuse me, graph, excuse me, biographical information. So generally first name, last name, uh, just contact information. Have you applied to NSU before as like an affiliation questions? Um, if there are any errors that you notice after the submission of your application, do contact us right away so we can correct that. The next portion is going to be generally more about your program and additional information. So that's where uh, which program that you're specifically applying to. Please ensure you are selecting the correct uh, term for entry, as that may affect then when you subsequently start and can uh, then become an issue if we need to make any sort of updates later on, say, if a deferral of your application is necessary. So uh, again, just verifying all information is collect or correct. And by the time you go to review your application, it'll be able to display all this information one last time. So you do have a couple of different checks along the way, uh, but we just want to reinforce that point. Then we get into the prior college information. So I know we do get a variety of international students uh, applying for the program here. Uh, on the note of non-U.S. institution college credit, we require all non-U.S. Uh, credit to be evaluated by an organization that's a part of what's called the National Association of Credential Evaluation Services, or NACES for short. Uh, there is a listing of active members, and any one of them is able to provide the uh, complete evaluation necessary for our application review. Um, those those reviews do tend to have different namings just due to the differences you might find among the servicers. But in general, what we're looking for is a comprehensive evaluation that must include a course by course analysis with the US grade equivalent, uh, must state if and when a degree was conferred, and should also state your cumulative undergraduate GPA. Uh, now for our US citizens, it's a little bit simpler of a process in comparison. Uh, we just need to have your uh, institution's register office or an approved third party vendor such as Parchment or the National Student Clearinghouse send us over your transcripts. You must have one of those two uh, bodies send the transcripts. We cannot accept them directly from you as the applicant for verification purposes. Uh, while most are able to send it electronically, we can't accept it uh, in physical mail. Uh, but first, if they are able to send it over email, it can be sent to this bottom email you're seeing on the slide here, electronic transcript at nova.edu. If it does become necessary to send physical copies, please reach out to us and I can send you over the physical address for that. Um, and then as a, just a quick reminder, then uh, if you are still completing your bachelor's degree, uh, we may then just need one final copy of your transcripts later on so it shows proof of degree confirmed. Now, once you go ahead and have done all those subsequent sections, that is all as what's compiled as the NSU application itself. At that point, it would ask you to review that data and then pay the $50 fee to submit your application. That does not mean that your application is complete. It's more so the first portion. So then you're gonna be able to see a second section, which is gonna be dubbed admissions documents. I apologize, it's a little bit uh, uh, older of a photo. I know it says supplemental items and documents here, but it's been updated to say admissions document as the second section. In this area is where you're going to be able to submit items like your essay, resume, and writing sample directly by uploading a file. 
However, for some of the other items, it's more so just for you to be able to track in real time. So the letter of recommendations, as well as your official transcripts will have a submission status. If you have received confirmation either from, say, your register office or parchment that the transcripts had been received uh, and they're not showing as received on your application, please reach out to myself or our office so that we can look into it. In some cases, it may just be a, a simple disconnect between the system. We just have to mark it received, but it had actually been uh, came to the university itself. Now, you must submit that $50 fee before you can send out recommendation requests. As soon as you do so, underneath in the admissions document section here, you'll be able to send out those recommendation requests. All you need is the email for your intended reference. They will receive an electronic form to complete, so it's a small survey, as well as then upload their uh, actual written letter to. Couple of things regards to formatting for the letter. So uh, ideally we do recommend it to be either Word documents or PDF for the upload process. And ideally it should be written on any applicable organization letterhead. So if say you're getting your letter of reference from an advisor from your school, then it should be written on that institution's letterhead. Uh, conversely then professional letter should be written on whatever business organization or entity that they're a part of. Now, more so on the letters of recommendations. There's two major mistakes made by references. So please, please, please double check with your references on these two items. First and foremost, saving their information. We very much need to make sure that we actually have a completed form that's submitted back over to us. I know many references intend to have a lot more details of their letter put on in the actual written letter, and that's completely fine. Uh, but we just need to make sure that they're still filling out the information for, say, their contact information, as well as then subsequent questions as part of the form. The other part of this, which is, uh, I would say, more of the bigger issue that we get a lot of times is actually having the written letter attached to the file. Now, I know this may seem uh, rather straightforward, but you'd be surprised this happens quite a lot. When the references go to attach their letter to the form, what will happen is they get on the top of the screen what you're seeing here in this first photo, which is the ability to choose a file. When they select the file, it has not been uploaded yet. You need to press the upload button as highlighted in the second photo for it to actually then be paired to the document. In many cases, what happens is they'll have completed the form, saved all that information, and thought they had attached the letter only to then submit it back to us and all we get is the completed form. So that is one of the major things that can hold up your application from being reviewed. So make sure when you're in connection with your references about doing this, that they understand the process. If you have any questions or if you're facing any issues, like maybe they didn't receive the recommendation request email, you can always reach out to us. Worst case scenario, we can have your reference email us directly with their intended letter. All right. So of course, one of the big questions is what we're looking at for actual costs here. So uh, we do our system by a per credit hour rate. Looking at the 2024-2025 fiscal year, you're looking at 843 per credit hour. And as a ballpark estimate, just so that you guys can understand, our students typically take six credits a semester. So you're going to be looking at just a little bit over 5000 a semester uh, in terms of tuition costs. Now, in total for the program, then what you'd be looking at is a little bit larger in comparison, of course. And I do like to clarify that our tuition rates do change on a year-to-year -year basis, but it's generally by small margins. So usually we see anywhere from like a two to four percent increase of course ideally we wouldn't want it to increase for you guys at all but just so you guys know um, now largely then what you'd be looking at in total for the program for 36 credits is then about twenty five thousand three hundred. i'm rounding up just a tab there um, but if you wanted exact numbers feel free to reach out to me we can look at that in more detail there's a tuition page i can point you towards as a little bit more breakdown especially for say any of our international students so that you guys can get a better idea about the cost of attendance necessary that you need to show, say, for your uh, F1 uh, visa purposes. Now, on the fee side of things, the $1,800 is a lot for your entire academic year. Uh, that's what it's referring to by calendar year. So that's split between your three semesters. So you have fall, winter, and summer. So that's subsequently then $600 per semester. You can think of that more as 
a student services fee. It's one of the few fees you do get on a reoccurring basis. There is also a health insurance requirement. Uh, all students enrolled at our university must have a health insurance requirement. However, if you do have your own health insurance or perhaps you're still on a family plan, you can uh, easily get that waived. So that's based on full-time status for our students. Again, being that six credit threshold, if you fall below full-time status, it would actually reduce down to 300. So then you'd be looking at 900 in total, say for one year of attendance at part-time status. Now, in terms of our financial aid and scholarship positions, uh, we have a few different types of scholarships and various paid positions throughout the university that you can apply for, but you must first be admitted to the program. Unfortunately, we don't have any merit-based award system, so the uh, general timeline for this, you would formally apply. After being reviewed and accepted, then you would then be able to look into applying for various scholarships or paid positions. Some of those scholarships or positions may be locked to a specific time of the calendar year. So say if you were to submit your FAFSA as a U.S. citizen and you were to qualify for federal work study. Many of those federal work study positions do not open up until closer to the uh, subsequent term that you would be looking to start, um, minus the summer semester as generally federal aid is usually for like fall and winter periods. Uh, but there are a variety of other jobs that you, may, uh, you can look into. We have a couple of different designations, such as our NSE, Nova Southeastern Employment Jobs, which can range as far as like scholarship positions or just generally hourly positions around the university itself. Um, and then for our various scholarships, we have three different types of scholarships that you can look into. Uh, we have on general what are called institutional scholarships, college-wide scholarships, and department scholarships. Most of the ones that you're seeing listed on the bullets here fall underneath department-specific scholarships. So for the MS and National Security Affairs program, you would be looking to uh, search for scholarships under our Department of Humanities and Politics. Um, Whereas then for certain paid positions, they could become available at different times throughout the year. We use an application for our uh, enrolled students that's called Job X, where you'd be able to see many of those different postings. Um, furthermore, if you'd like to look at the details of some of these scholarships you're seeing listed here, you may go to the link listed at the bottom of the slide there, which is hcast.nova.edu slash scholarships. Uh, and I am happy to say we have introduced a, an additional section to that page, uh, which refers to some of the different tuition discount opportunities we have through the Helmholtz College here at our university. I would stipulate that that page is more specifically just for informational purposes. It's not necessarily where you would go to, uh, say, inquire further uh, or apply for said discounts, but it does take you to the uh, correlative web resource page that can get you to that point. If you have any questions about any of those discounts, of course, feel free to reach out to us and we can help guide you through that process. Uh, just to list some of those off, one of the more larger well-known ones, of course, is our employee tuition discount program. So if you do find yourself working full-time at the university here, you may have the opportunity to take advantage of that employee tuition discount pending a couple of uh, pieces, such as a six-month probationary period. Uh, but then we do also actually have a partnership with our Veterans Resource Center, so we're able to provide a 20% discount for uh, members of the U.S. Armed Forces and their immediate family members. So that usually uh, directly means either a spouse or a dependent. Um, and then if any of you are from the local area and you get to work with Broward Sheriff Office, we also offer a discount program with them. Uh, again, any questions regarding that, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, as we uh, learn more about various discounts or if we're able to create any, I am looking forward to being able to add any of those over there. And of course, as we hear about anything, I always like to share that with our applicants and current students. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, we'd be happy to have you. Most of our uh, social media handles are usually going to be NSU HCAS, so that's H-C-A-S, or our large, excuse me, longer name of NSU Hamos College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we have been recording our open house here today, and we'll be posting this on our YouTube after we edit it a little bit uh, after today. Um, so if you'd like to reference this later on, you can check us all out on our YouTube again at NSU Hamos College. Uh, but at this time, I would love to open up to any questions from the audience. Go right ahead, Elizabeth, and you should be able to speak. Thank you. I have a few questions. Um, the first one, what's the average class size? Great question. Uh, did you want to answer on that one, Dr. Edwards? Yeah, so five to 10 students, right? So ranges, and again, it varies. Some classes may be small, some classes maybe three, some maybe 12, but 
right? Five to 10, right, is the, the average on class size. Great. And then what's usually the meeting times for a class? Like, is it once a week or twice a week? And what are the, the time frames? Yeah, so the classes, primarily the ones that meet on campus are once a week and normally from, let's say, 6 to 9 p.m., normally between Tuesday and Thursday. Um, so yeah, once a week, 6 to 9, Tuesday through um, Thursday. Okay. And then can I take one class at a time instead of the two? I know that's going to push out my completion date a little bit, but I can't take two classes at a time. Uh, maybe Teddy can answer that, but absolutely, right? We have students that have taken one class at a time. As long as, you, as long as you stay enrolled in the program, and again, students have taken up to four classes at a time. But we recommend, um, as Teddy said, two. Some can push it and do three. It depends, obviously, your work and your right, home life balance. But yeah, one one class per semester is absolutely fine. And then my last question. Um, I'm currently working for a university, and I already graduated undergrad. I, I graduated this past May, but I'm taking a year's grace period. Um, and I was hoping, I'm hopefully taking a music class on campus, but obviously it's not related to my major in undergrad at all. This is just like an elective for non-majors. Would I have to submit a transcript from my my current employer too? Um, if it's just for a, a random elective course like that, I don't believe it'll be necessary um, unless you really want that, Dr. Edwards. <laughs> No, and I think it's good to reiterate on what, what Teddy said earlier regarding your entire application, right? So certain things weigh differently, right? Depends on who's actually evaluating the transcript. So some professors may look at your writing sample and your letter re recommendation and give that more weight than, let's say, your GPA, right? Um, you know, your also your personal statement, right? And you need to, I guess, detail how our program, right, works well or dovetails neatly right, with what you want to do in your future, right? So I would suggest, right, thinking about your application is um even if you, you're not strong in one particular area, right, that's okay, right? You know, so we can actually, right, we evaluate it, we're quite pragmatic. But yeah, so you, you may have strengths, so emphasize those strengths and emphasize how your future um, ambitions right, tie itself to, to our program. Great, thank you. No problem, Elizabeth. All right. And then Ryan had a question here. Um, just I'll click answer live here. So uh, he said he wanted to learn a little bit more about the online course experience. Uh, how are the courses communicated, especially for, say, the cybersecurity component? All right. So, Ryan, I actually can't speak for the cybersecurity um, because right, that's not we you're in an entirely different department. But um, so the online experience, it varies per professor. I don't normally do online. But you may have, right, so you have discussion discussion boards. So they may ask you to interact once or twice per week. And there may be some meetings, right, throughout the semester where you meet one-on-one -on -one with a professor for a variety of reasons. But I think with the online, you will have probably at least one interaction per week with the professor or with your, your colleagues. Um, but again, that varies by, by professor. So if you can, if you can, Ryan, uh, make it to the ground, the ground courses. I like, I would love to have you in, in you know, in the classroom. So, but if you can't, the online uh, works for you. And again, the professors will have their own, right. Um, you know, specifics in terms of meeting and how much you have to interact um, in a week or in a month or throughout the entire semester. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Uh, we had another question uh, referring to Wes. So yes, if you are referring to World Evaluation Services, that is an approved vendor underneath NASIS, so we can accept uh, their evaluations. But yes, we will require a transcript evaluation. And I see your hand up again, Elizabeth. Did you have another question? I did. Can you hear me? Yes. Um. So I'm also hoping to join um, and, and to complete the program virtually. I live in Indiana, so I couldn't attend in-person classes. But would it be possible that we apply for the hybrid courses and then just opt to join through Zoom each week? Absolutely. 
right? So again, this 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 program is very flexible. You could take it entirely online and not have a single campus on ground. Um, but we have, so my course would be, let's say it's Tuesday night at six. We have students that actually, we have a conference room. So students will come to the class and they sit down mm -hmm. and we'll have a conversation like a traditional um, graduate seminar. At the same time on our screen in the, the conference room, right, you have students joining online via Zoom in this format. And again, we have the conversations back and forth. So you, it, it's ultimate flexibility. The only thing that you have to be flexible is obviously, right? You have to, you know, you know, 6 to 9 p.m., right? This particular time, this particular day of the week, but you don't have to actually be on campus. So you can be in Indiana and we can have our, our class every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Thank you. No problem, Elizabeth. So another question here. And then a uh, question from Al was asking, do you offer full funding for the program itself? So um, I know uh, I'm not as familiar with the positions that the department themselves offer, but in terms of scholarships, I'm afraid we don't have full funding. Uh, we do have partial scholarship fundings. Uh, I believe Dr. Edwards, they're able to have a maximum of two scholarships from the department, correct? Yeah, you, you may be right. I, yeah, to the in terms of the question, like full funding, I, yeah, I don't think that's, an option, um, not something that I have actually experienced in, in my time. And then I had actually one other question. It's a common question I do get from some of the uh, students, actually. Um, perhaps you can speak on it a little bit more, Dr. Edwards. What can students expect if they want to choose to do the thesis route in terms of kind of like timeline for that and, and what they would be uh, needing to do? Yeah, so you would have to decide Approximately, when you get to 30 credits out of your 36, right, we will reach out to you and ask you if you want to do the thesis um, or the, the comprehensive exam, and you make that decision. You would want to first pick a faculty advisor, right? So someone that you're comfortable with, um, and, you know, so pick a faculty advisor that will, I don't know if you get the helicopter, sorry, but <laughs> so there's a faculty advisor you choose, and then you would choose two additional readers, so these are also two um, additional professors that will be on your committee. Um, but you'll primarily be going back and forth with your faculty advisor. And this has to be done over two semester periods. So let's say you did fall to the winter. Um, you know, ideally you want to get much of the work done in the first semester, because as you reach the end of the, the second semester, it's primarily dealing with you um, streamlining, right, editing and defending the thesis. So much of the substantive work should be done in the first semester. Um, yeah, and again, so, in, you know, the thesis is not the, it's not the the popular route because it, it tends to be more, you know, a little bit more difficult, uh, a little bit more intensive, time intensive and labor intensive. But, um, you know, intellectually, right, I would love for you to actually do the thesis and we'll guide you along, right? The Like we, we have a, a system set up where we'll guide you along through this process so you won't feel like you're on your own, like you're stranded. Did anyone have any other questions though? All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for staying with us here today. Uh, if you think of anything else, feel free to shoot us an email or a phone call and we're happy to talk and hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Edwards. Absolutely. Thank you, Teddy. Uh, thank you, Farah. Al, Ryan, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing you get applications in, and hopefully we see you in the winter. <laughs>